Welcome everyone. This is rather nerve-wracking. Um, my name is Sonia Wutzka. I'm the Deputy Director of the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you here tonight and also people who are seeing us um, virtually. And I feel like I need to look up to you and I'm sure that's not where you are. Um, but regardless, we, we soldier on. So um, before I start, of course, I'd very much like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get going. Um, we are live streaming webcasting tonight, which is, hence my anxiety levels are slightly up, but seems to be going well so far. So for those of you who are live streaming, we welcome you. And apparently at the bottom of your screen, there is ask a question button. So at any point throughout the session, if you'd like to ask a question, apparently you can do that. And somehow we will see it and respond accordingly, <laughs> which I very much look forward to seeing. There is also a Twitter hashtag that is at the bottom of the screen there. And so by all means, we'd love a conversation happening about the proceedings. So very briefly, I really don't want to take up your time, is just to introduce the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre who are proudly hosting tonight with the George Institute. So we're a collaborative of number of um, researchers, policy makers, practitioners across Australia, a large initiative funded through NHMRC. We're the second of um, an NHMRC partnership centre with five years of funding with a focus on systems approaches to the prevention of lifestyle related chronic disease. So we are, of course, a large initiative, lots of different uh, projects occurring, and one that we're very excited about and very pleased that Jan, um, Jan Mohunthan is able to um, present as well tonight with our guest speaker. Jan is um, a PhD candidate through the Partnership Centre, and together with a number of, there's now, I think, um, four PhD candidates through the Partnership Centre, so we're really supporting some emerging um, uh, researchers with some very in innovative ideas um, and contemporary issues such as tonight around public health law. So I'd now, without any further ado, like to introduce Stephen Jan from um, the George Institute who is co-hosting with us and I really hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. Um, um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're on. Um, the Gadigal um, people of the Eora Nation. Um, yeah, as Sonia says, I'm uh, from the George Institute. My name's Stephen Jan. I'm the head of the Health Economics and Process Evaluation Program there. Um, just a little bit about the George Institute. We're a medical research institute, which is affiliated with uh, the University of Sydney. And we, our work involves sort of clinical trials, large-scale epidemiological studies, health services, research. And we do work in Australia as well as um, um, in the region. Um, and uh, today's speakers, um, uh, well, firstly, uh, Scott Burris is we're really privileged to have here. And um, Scott is uh, the professor of uh, law at uh, Temple Law School at Temple University. And he's also the director of uh, the Centre for Health Policy Law. Sorry, I need to take my glasses off. <laughs> Health Law Policy and Practice. And... Um, He's had a long and distinguished career in public health law, beginning with um, some pioneering work uh, in the 1980s and 90s on uh, HIV. Um, his current program uh, involves uh, public health law and uh, its influences on public uh, behaviour, public health behaviour. And uh, what distinguishes his work from that of a lot of other law researchers is uh, the empirical approach he takes to public health law. And that's really the focus that uh, had attracted us to, to, to his, his program. Um, Scott will speak for about 40 minutes. And um, following Scott, uh, Jan Mohunthan, who uh, will, will, will give a response. And Jan is um, a PhD student uh, uh, who I supervise. She's at the... Um, based at the George Institute, and her PhD, as Sonia says, is, is um, through, sponsored by the, um, uh, the Australian Partnership Prevention Centre. Her work um, is looking at um, public health law and chronic disease prevention. She's done a number of studies in this area, and, and like Scott, has taken a, an empirical approach to, to, to public health law. Uh, Jan's background uh, is in, uh, uh, in children's law and human rights, and... Um, and uh, uh, she's uh, 
at the moment uh, developing her, her, I suppose, her empirical research skills through her PhD. So, so that's um, an outline of the program today. So we'll have 40 minutes for Scott, 15 minutes for Jan, and then following that we'll have about um, 25 minutes for question and answers. So um, without uh, any further ado, I'll, I'll hand you over to, to Scott. Well, thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. And um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, also, hello to all of you in the live streaming audience. They tell me this is going to the big billboards in Times Square. So, you know, hello, New York City. Um, I am going to um, take you through several kinds of, of ideas here. I'm going to start with some things that are absolutely incontestable that you all will certainly agree with. Then I'll move on to a bunch of things you already know. And then I'm going to finish up with some very obvious conclusions. Um, and I, it, what I'm hoping to suggest here is that, that the points I'm going to make um, are really points about what we accept as normal um, in, in terms of the influence of law on public health and the relationship of, of, of law to public health and the idea of who does work in law and public health. And that in many ways, our, our settled attitudes are, are inconsistent with, with a lot of things that we, we understand and, and know from our own experience. Now, I always like to call this a TED talk because it sounds like it's going to be really pithy and you know, sort of stride around the stage, cool kind of stuff. But in fact, in, in my case, um, TED stands for something different. Um, I am mobilized or motivated in this work by a sense not that um, using law effectively for public health and, and, and studying law effectively in public health is um, a difficult or impossible task, um, but rather that, that we often don't do it as strategically, effectively, or as quickly as we can. And when we take too long to figure out, to develop effective interventions or de develop and identify important law reforms, the loss is measured in morbidity and mortality. It's measured in people whose illnesses or deaths could have been prevented. Um, and so my emphasis here is on how, not so much how we can reinvent the public health law wheel, but how we can do it better, uh, better and faster. So here's some of the incontestable truth part of the talk. Um, law is a really extremely important force in public health. As a tool of intervention, um, as this slide shows, you can probably barely read it, but what this slide shows is what the CDC in America called the 10 greatest public health achievements of the 20th century. And every single one of them was advanced to a greater or lesser extent, and sometimes to a pretty high degree, by legal interventions. So if you take, you know, vac just to take the top two, vaccination, of course, has, has been advanced um, strongly by mandatory vaccination laws for school entry. Um, motor vehicle safety is almost inconceivable without law. We use law to do everything from mandate safer road designs to safer automobile designs to personal behavior in cars, wearing seat belts, drink driving, that kind of thing. Um, and write down that list. You couldn't have the the success we've had in 20th century in reducing preventable death and injury without law. But it's also important to keep in mind that there is a lot of law having an influence on health that isn't called health law. These are a couple of examples from, um, from studies that just, I'm not picking on New York, but they happen to be about New York. The first one um, is a study 10, 15 years ago that um, traced the history of zoning laws um, in New York City and showed that systematically for over 150 years, New York used zoning or zoning-like rules to cite insalubrious land uses to poorer communities. So the fact that if you were poor, you lived near the dump or near the slaughterhouse or near the factory that was belching lead residue was not some kind of accident or market choice. That was actually systematic public policy advanced through law. So law was making, putting people into a position of vulnerability um, that led to differential patterns of morbidity and mortality in the population. Um, a more recent study, this is a study that my program funded uh, of the stop and frisk program in New York. This is very controversial, but it might not have reached 
uh, all the way across the Pacific. Um, this was a, a part of a quality of life policing approach that was meant to forestall large offenses by intervening in small infractions. But what really happened was that police massively interfered with young black men um, and pretty much nobody else. And so that it was common for people to be stopped multiple times in a year, and sometimes many times in a month, and interfere with the police. And what we did, in, or what the people we funded did in this study was uh, investigate the mental health impact of that kind of constant experience of vulnerability towards the police. And guess what? Found out it wasn't so good. So there's nothing about quality of life policing that's inherently about health. And yet um, this kind of um, legal practice was acting you know, in a, to, as an ideologic force. It was shaping people's um, health and mental health. And that's quite common. I mean, you just think about tax laws, which um, determine um, the distribution of income and ultimately wealth in a society. When I was born, when I was young, um, we had um, the least income inequality in the history of the United States. And for the, since my birth, my age has gone up and the progressivity of the tax system has gone down uh, to the point where in the United States now we have the greatest income inequality since the late 19th century. Um, again, that's, that's public policy, that's law uh, shaping that with all the consequences that we know inequality can have or capture as a measure. Uh, now, nothing I'm saying here about the impact of law as a tool of intervention, the impact of law as a, a, a ideologic force is, is, uncontest, is, is contested or new. I mean, this is something people recognize. There's a huge evidence base. It's a little bit, it's, it's kind of a funny evidence base because it, you won't find too much um, research that talks about, well, we're doing legal evaluation. What you find is people doing auto safety or alcohol policy or tobacco policy. Um, and, and that's you know, one of the things that in, in my program we were trying to work against because we realize that, that these people are all evaluating the impact of laws and legal practices on health, and yet we're not getting the full sort of interdisciplinary and cross-topical fertilization that can, make, can lead to advances in methods and <clears throat> um, to a broader understanding of how um, we use law in public health. The bad news is that that incredible evidence base and that record of success and that strong story of importance has been told on a shoestring. So this is uh, as yet unpublished data where we've got under submission now that where we looked at, tried to identify all the NIH grants that actually funded an empirical evaluation of law, of a law or, or set of laws or legal practices on, on health. And so you can see that in say 2010 to 2014, NIH, granted 218,000 grants, 247 of which were legal evaluations. Now, I'm not saying we should get all the money, <laughs> um, but that's a tiny fraction compared to, you know, what we, you know, the impact of law and health. And, and, the, and the, or think of it another way. Um, every year, um, Legislatures in, our, in my country pass you know, well over 1,000 health laws, um, not to mention all the other laws they pass that could be influencing health. So they're treating thousands, millions of people. And yet, we can go for years or ever without actually finding out whether that treatment is effective or whether it has negative side effects. You know, we wouldn't tolerate that if we were talking about a pharmaceutical that you know, 50,000 people in a year will use. Um, if we start to think of law as a treatment, um, this kind of imbalance in funding and the lack of attention to evaluation becomes really scandalous. There's no other word for it. Um, so you know, my, my lucky story is that having been interested in this topic for many years, someone actually gave me the resources to do something about it. Um, which was also then placing upon me the responsibility to figure out, well, what is this field of, of, of legal evaluation in, in health and, and, and how do we um, increase the degree to which the, the rigorous methods that we know are out there and the expertise that we know is out there um, can be harnessed uh, and encouraged to do more work across more um, of the fields of law. Um, so, you know, in any kind of interdisciplinary project, 
it's, it's important to just define some basic terrain so that people can identify what it is that you're claiming is the it that they should pay attention to. And so we called this, this field public health law research. Um, and we wrote some papers that kind of defined in a very broad term what you might think of as the conceptual interface. You know, the, the simple version of what the field was that people in different disciplines could recognize and plug themselves into uh, so that they collaborate across their silos. Um, but the key is that, you know, the definition, the scientific study of the relation of law and legal practices to public health. Now, this excessive delay problem, it seemed to me, and the lack of funding and often recognition um, and willingness to take on law in public health, um, it seemed to me to be a, fundamentally a cultural problem um, in that, you know, on, on the health side, um, it's, it, was, it's still, it still is and then even more common to run into a kind of attitude among the doctors and social scientists and epidemiologists who populate the world of health research and health practice and the people who make the decisions about where the funding should go and so on, um, that you know, law was some kind of different thing. That's not something they dealt with. You, know, it, you had to have special training in law. You couldn't really, if you didn't go to law school, if you weren't a lawyer, you should just not touch it. Um, and so you know, it, it's best to be avoided and, and certainly not something that, that's really capable of scientific evaluation. I remember the, the, the greatest expression of this in my experience was I went to the Global Fund for, um, to control HIV, TB, and malaria to give a talk on essentially measuring law um, and doing evaluation of the impact of law in the AIDS uh, campaign. And the guy, and I was doing this for the evaluation team, so I felt great because I had this group of you know my people, the evaluators. I was going to talk to them in very practical terms about how to do um, more evaluation of the impact of laws. And the guy who introduces me says, "You know, this is this is Professor Burris. He's the guy who's going to tell us how to measure the unmeasurable." You know, I was crestfallen. Let's just say as a start, because that's the whole point, right? It is purely a false belief. Um, a kind of cultural artifact for someone to think that law, legal practices can't be measured like any other social phenomena. Law is just a bunch of institutions and people having interactions, carrying out you know, written and unwritten rules and policies. And all of that can be studied like, just like the operation of a church or a hospital or a business. You know, any kind of social phenomenon can be studied. Just law is absolutely not different. Um, but at the same time, I think we lawyers were guilty um, in a cultural way of, of profiting by the, uh, uh, by the illusion that we were somehow holders of secret special knowledge. Um, so, you know, we could talk about recip loquitar and, you know, uh, stare decisis and, you know, standards of care and stuff, and we could sort of throw up a, an aura of, of special knowledge um, from a position that would say to people, you know, you, need, you in health, you need to listen to us. You don't understand, but we can explain it to you. Rely on our guidance. Um, and so you know, on the one hand, in this relationship, we had a sort of cultural orientation towards, well, we don't do that. And on the other hand, we had a sort of cultural position of, well, you know, of course you don't. Just let us tell you what you should do. So it, it seemed to me that we had to, and I uh, just sort of, well, I won't get into the derivation of that slide, but it's an enduring quality in public health law. If you go back, you know, even 100 years in, in, in the writing about public health, it's very much, the idea is very much that what people in health need to do is understand that there are laws and they need to ask lawyers what they should do about those laws. Um, and there's not that there's anything wrong with that because that's certainly a piece of the puzzle, but it's not really um, the full kind of relationship between law and public health that, that I realized and my colleagues realized we ought to be um, trying to to foist on the world of, of public health. So we, we had a strategy as, as people coming from the law position um, that we were going to try and translate law into the language of science and health. Um, we would try and use the terms that, that health people use. And we were going to try and, rather than sort of ask to explain and, 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 and tell them things, we would show ways in which uh, law was being measured and could be measured and the way evaluation was being done. Um, but also that we were going to try and learn something from the health side. Um, that you know, standard legal approaches to, 
to doing things like legal research could actually be improved by adopting some um, scientific practices that were uh, easily available to us to borrow. So the, the, you know, the underlying point, as I've already suggested, was that we were going to treat law as a normal human behavior, um, and we were going to, or a normal social phenomenon that could be studied by normal scientific means. And that, that you know, our mission was to show why that was so, and how people who were used to studying social phenomena but had been steering away from law could start to study law too um, and help advance our knowledge of this really effective tool for public health. Uh, so the, you know, the, the first thing we, we, we did was to focus on the, 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 the problem of the independent variable. You know, any study, any evaluation of a, of a law is going to have to start with some measurement of what that, that law is. And, you know, in fact, for... You know, 20 or 25 years in America when we started this, people had been doing scientific um, measurement of law. Uh, the NIH had funded something called the Alcohol Policy Information System, which eventually grew to have over 35 different data sets of basic alcohol control laws laid out you know, where, in which the, the text of the law had been changed into numbers, in which you know, the key features had been observed and, and had been uh, studied as variables. And this very complicated uh, flowchart here uh, from an evaluation review article was meant to simply explain how it is that you, you know, at least one way to reliably do that process, to capture those important features. Um, this was fundamentally based on something that lawyers don't do, which is to observe but not interpret. Right? Um, you know, the, really, the, the thing I had to learn as a lawyer um, was that although I, you know, I could typically pick up a, a statute and read it, and at the end of my reading I could tell you what it meant, but I might not be able to tell you what it said, because in our business there's a premium on interpretation and on speed and facility with interpretation. Um, but for observation purposes, for studying law, for evaluation purposes, you actually want to minimize, at least in the first layer of work, uh, interpretation. You want to observe, you ideally want to have a data set that anybody who followed the same protocol would create um, so that you have um, the usual level of transparency um, and reproducibility that we'd expect in any kind of scientific work. Um, now, as we did this work um, and started to think about how we could generalize it and, and tell the story of, of scientific uh, legal measurement, we grappled or it came upon the idea of policy surveillance as a way of explaining what we were doing um, to people in health. And of course, you can see this is a great example of using health language instead of um, law language. So in America, in, in, in health law, we used to call multi-jurisdictional research. We used to say 50-state surveys. We're doing a 50-state survey. We're doing some legal mapping. Um, calling it policy surveillance evoked um, in a health audience, the case for doing this, right? We do surveillance of phenomena that are of continuous importance and that vary over time and space. And we do that because we don't want to just go and look out what's going on when we, when we have a particular question. We want to have data available that allows us to see trends and changes over time. Um, so that's the surveillance idea. And, and then, of course, we were taking data and turn, we were taking law and turning it into data, structured data, which was also a great communication tool. Right? Because if I show a, and I've done this over the years, if I show an epidemiologist a memo that I would write as a lawyer, it, it, it sort of makes no sense to that epidemiologist. But if I show the epidemiologist a table with zeros and ones, you know, I show that structured data, immediately the person gets it. Oh, I see, so you've got You've got some observations about some condition um, across space and across time. The interesting thing we found when we started to push this idea, though, was that we could, we, we could do a lot more than just create data for evaluation, things that were also really important in public health. For one thing, the key to the ultimate impact of any kind of legal innovation for health is how rapidly it spreads once we know it works. Right? If it takes 10 years to spread instead of five years, that's five years' worth of prevention that you miss. 
And how does law diffuse? I mean, one big way that, that law diffuses is people find out who's got what law, and we can identify those places that don't have a law that they should have, and we can mobilize to get that law enacted. And policy surveillance allowed us to do that because in addition to capturing who had the law, we naturally captured who didn't. Um, and we could also capture the trends and begin to show, um, as I'll show you in a minute, um, how these laws um, were spreading across the country, which creates you know, kind of cascade effects and shame effects uh, that influence legislators. It was also really important, we realized, uh, to deal with the problem of the, uh, the, I don't know what you'd call it, the, the ungrounded legal observation or the untracked uh, legal recommendation, I guess the way I should put it. So it's quite common for health bodies, whether it's the WHO or the CDC or the federal government, or I'm sure your government, to recommend things like all states should have a bicycle helmet law. Now, these recommendations litter the scene you know, there's, adopt this policy, adopt that policy. Almost never can the recommending agency tell you how many jurisdictions had adopted that law at the time of the recommendation, nor can they tell you five years later whether anybody followed that recommendation, simply because they weren't doing the necessary surveillance. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, in the AIDS, I, you know, the reference was made to the fact that I've worked on HIV. You know, I've worked on, I worked on HIV starting in the 1985, and almost from the start, there was a recognition that some basic human rights protective laws were probably important to creating an environment in which people would seek treatment and care um, and testing. And pretty soon that became dogma so that there was no reputable national or international agency that wasn't saying you have to enact this kind of protective environment. And yet, two, three years ago, I was on something called a UN, UN age, uh, task force called the Commission on HIV and the Law on a technical advisory group, and our job was to sort of do an assessment of where we stood on this. And even then, in 2014, you know, 30 years into the HIV epidemic, there was no reliable data on who had adopted, what countries had adopted such laws. It had been a recommendation for 30 years. That just wouldn't happen, you know, in any other sector, as going back to my cultural argument. Finally, I thought, you know, if we make legal information more available to people um, in public health. Possibly we also create greater opportunities for um, people to develop legal interest and competency and comfort with the law. Um, so to do all that, we, we looked at, we took some of the, the money that the foundation gave us and we built um, a website where people could get access to the data if they wanted to do the research, but also that, that, that non-researchers could interact with the law and we could help spread the word about what was happening legally. Um, we created uh, a tool um, for building legal data sets um, so that researchers around the world could contribute to the store of legal data. One of the, the nice things about um, the law is that if it's properly observed once, you don't have to do it again. I mean, you have to update it, but you don't have to have 10 people over time looking at the same law and doing the same research. Um, because if you're just observing its characteristics according to a, 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 a transparent protocol, you're going to get the same results pretty much every time. So this, this software, you can see, this doesn't look like what we lawyers would do with law. This is a list of data sets that I'm working on. This, uh, these all have to do with emergency preparedness law in, uh, in uh, 25 uh, developing countries. Um, and if I look at one of my data sets, you know, it, it looks like structured data. Every country, every record is a, is, a, is a unique combination of legal provisions for a particular place, for a particular time. If the law changes, that's a new record. Um, so law, law, you can build records longitudinally. This is a, uh, the, the, on the left, you see a bunch of names, students of mine who are working on this, um, because we don't do this one person coding law. Well, we have multiple people coding, and we you know, compare our results and, and, and determine a, a rate of reliability among, among coders. Um, down on the lower left-hand side are the questions that, that we use. We, uh, um, and this is what the workspace looks like. We load the law into the system. So you have the law on one side, and in the same screen, you have the questions you have to ask. And um, thinking in terms of uh, the future, 
the system is designed to capture not just a citation that you sort of type in, but we, the system will associate the particular words in the law that answer the question in a particular variable um, as, a, as, a, as, an, as itself a variable so that um, down the road we hope we can start to use machine-assisted practices to do this, um, to do this kind of work. Um, tracking trends, obviously very important. So we had a problem in the US, I guess you've talked about it here some, um, of concern about concussions in sports and particularly then it spread to concern about kids playing school sports and getting concussions, particularly football, American football. Um, and in 2009, um, first Washington and then two other states passed a, 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 a sort of a law to start to deal with, which I'll come into a, in, a, in a minute in more detail, to deal with the problem of youth sports concussion. And um, <laughs> it spread very quickly. Um, so just two years later, you had look at how many jurisdictions um, had adopted this. And by 2014, the entire country was saturated. We had um, every state had passed one of these laws. Now, this actually happens more than you think. And when we've been tracking law, we've been to realize how popular legal solutions to health problems are across a whole range of, of topic areas in spite of the belief that people don't like the law and they don't like paternalistic state intervention. It's not reflected in reality. Um, but this also means that every ch school child participating in sports in the country is now exposed to this, this basically the same legal model. And yet we don't know whether it's effective or harmful. Um, it happens so fast that even if, if NIH had been jumping on it right away, it would be hard to, to have interfered with that cascade. Um, our system also allows people to look at the text of the law, which is helpful for diffusing innovation because you know, the question people ask, the two questions any you know, legislator or stakeholder will ask in a policy process is who else has done it? You know, what's the state next door doing? And well, what, you know, what's it look like? What's the model? What's, what, 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 what should the law be, uh, be like? And, we helped try and help both of those things. Um, we've also built some systems for um, state health departments who just want to have their employees get easier access to law. So these are not designed to create um, uh, variables that can be used across jurisdictions. If, if you looked at any of these 110 areas that we end up covering, 110 statutory areas we end up covering for the state of Nebraska, it's all just question and answers where the question is, you know, what does, what's the definition of a, of, a, of a dog kennel and, and, you know, animal control law, and then the answer is the, law, the language of the statute. So it's a way for people who are not lawyers but who have to work with the law in their daily practice to get, to get an easier view of, of what it says. Um, so that's what happens when you, when you measure the law, um, and it's possible to do it a lot better than we've done it so far. And it's ultimately, I think, possible for us to think of it as a kind of collaborative practice um, so that if we, if, we, if, we, if we succeed in having a kind of open source ethic, researchers who build these kind of data sets and share them have taken care of that particular branch of law, at least for some period of time, for all of us. Um, and that makes it uh, uh, more efficient and more attractive as a, as a research tool. Uh, but once you have the law, you still have to do the study to do the evaluation. That's just getting the independent variable. And here the problem has largely been one of theory. Um, time and time again, when one goes into the literature uh, to look at, at, at health studies of the impact of law, you get essentially a black box between the law and the health outcome. Maybe people will put in demographic variables of one kind or another, but whether the person who's subject to the law is black or white or male or female or rich or poor is not always really very important. Sometimes it is, but it certainly doesn't tell you how the law got the change, either in an environment or in a behavior that leads to a health effect. Um, so we were definitely pushing the idea that, that any, most any study looking at the effect of law should be as well theor theorized as um, you know, any other kind of social or behavioral research in, in, in public health. So let me go back to that concussion example to suggest how that plays out. So this is essentially the logic model that was undergirding um, the concussion laws that passed. They were all pretty much the same model. Um, they were aimed at repeat concussions um, rather than primary concussion for the powerful political reason that if you really wanted to prevent concussions from happening at all, you would have had to change the rules of football. 
And given the, both the culture and the evidence at, at the time these laws were emerging, there was simply no political basis for that. No one was going to say kids couldn't play football. No one was going to say they couldn't tackle each other. Um, that just wasn't going to happen. Um, and yet the, the, the causal chain between the first concussion and repeat concussions was, was important to understand in order to figure out how you might do something to prevent those repetitions. And, and based on um, you know, a certain amount of social and behavioral research that we already had and general knowledge, um, and I think plausible, uh, plausible guessing, um, three main risk factors for, um, for a repeat concussion were identified, one being that people didn't know how <coughs> to detect when someone suffered a concussion, so they just didn't know it. Um, or that they knew that, but they thought that was just that there certainly was a culture of, well, you know, that's just part of being a man. You know, you get, you get your clock cleaned would be the phrase we would use. Um, and you get up and you keep playing, because um, how's that going to hurt? That happens all the time. And the last is that there was a, a fear, a unwillingness, particularly among the players, but sometimes also among the coaches, an unwillingness to acknowledge a concussion, because that would have meant that a potentially valuable player had to leave the game, or a, a, student, a kid would feel that they were letting the side down um, by being weak. Um, but what that led to was that either kids who had concussions either weren't removed from play, or they were removed from play but allowed to return too soon, um, both of which led to a much heightened risk of repeat concussion and much more serious consequences down the road. So when lawmakers started to look, and, 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 and people from public health schools and, and the National Football League, started to look at what you might do to interrupt this chain. Um, I mean, obviously, they thought of informational strategies, um, requiring coaches to be trained, um, but also doing some, using some kind of informed consent mechanism to get information into the hands of parents and kids with the hope that they might read it. Um, that's a bit of a stretch, but it's a good first try, you might say. Um, but also to state a, a behavioral rule that could be observed, you know, which is require the removal of athletes who've been suspected of having concussions and do not let them return to play without medical clearance. Now, the interesting thing about these laws is that in, in all but one state, there was no punishment, no penalty, no enforcement mechanism. And some people thought, well, that means this is just a, a mere gesture. This isn't intended to have an effect. But actually, if you think about it from a you know, broader regulatory theory perspective, there was an enforcement mechanism and an oversight mechanism. It was the parents in the stands. If the informed consent process succeeded in making them more aware of the risks of concussion, so that they were concerned that their kids not suffer, then they were up there watching. And any coach would feel those eyes uh, you know, burning on his or her neck. And you know, one would hope. This would lead to um, compliance, even though nobody was going to get punished with a fine or loss of a job. Now, these laws are passed. They're starting to be applied. We want to see if they're working. And we should be trying to see that as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, one could use legal theory. Um, and because we're talking about public health law, that's maybe a natural, natural result. So one of the most um, successful uh, explanatory frameworks for understanding why people obey the law in the last 20 or 30 years is from social psychology, um, Tom Tyler's theory of procedural justice. And in this model, the idea is that people obey the law either for the traditional Weberian reason that they feel they must because the government has a right to make laws and it's the obligation of citizens to obey, um, or they obey um, because they have experienced the law as a fair system. And that both, in, in Tyler's research, increases that sense of legitimacy of the system and also uh, directly influences motivation to comply, leading to more compliance. So these, this, this tells you some stuff that you can go out and observe in the world um, very easily through surveys. Um, you can uh, ask, uh, you can investigate the extent to which stakeholders, in this case, the parents and the students and the, and the, and the uh, um, uh, kids, think that the legislature is, a, is a, a proper arbiter of sport, which is actually kind of an interesting question. It's not clear that they do believe that. They might think this is interfering with private life, but you can investigate that. Um, and if, it's so, if, in fact, they don't think it's legitimate, that's going to predict lack of compliance. 
Um, or you can look at whether the, they believe the rules are being fairly applied, because the big question here is we all want to win. If we think somehow this gives an advantage to the other team and disadvantages our team, then potentially that would lead to attitudes that suggest this is an unfair rule, and that, again, would lead to less motivation to comply. But actually, a much better way to study this, and in fact, researchers did study it this way, was to use standard behavioral theory. So even though it's law, there's no reason you can't use you know, well-recognized um, behavioral theory. Here, the theory of, of, of planned behavior um, works perfectly well. Because remember the mechanism I talked about, um, the belief um, that parents might be um, disapproving of someone who doesn't take a kid out, the coach doesn't take out. Well, that's the subjective norms part. That's the community norms are changing. We no longer believe it's good to keep playing. Um, the sense that, there are, that norms have changed and, that, and that, that there's now a rule that tells me I must do something may give the coach a greater sense of self-efficacy or even the child playing a greater sense of self-efficacy so that they can pull themselves out of the game. Um, and of course, it may directly change attitudes so that the, the coach no longer thinks of this as harmless and innocent, but actually is a threat to a kid that the coach is in charge of. And of course, that leads to greater intention to report and, then, and, and, and ultimately to a behavior. And in fact, this study using that found that uh, the laws were not having the effect we hoped early on. Maybe they're changing, but um, that the people probably were not getting enough of the information about how bad this was, and therefore um, their attitudes were not changing. And so we didn't expect as much behavior change as, as we would have hoped. So um, all this leads me to um, articulating a, a different way of thinking about who does public health law and what public health law is. Right, so on the left side there, you see sort of what we traditionally called public health law, which is the work of lawyers, which is providing counsel and representation and doing legal research and analysis. And that's crucial. It's absolutely vital to public health. It's done wonderful things for public health in the last 100 years, and it'll continue to be essential. And it continues to need more support than it gets. But what my friends at the CDC like to call legal epidemiology is also part of public health law. Like that's all this work in understanding the, in investigating how law actually influences and shapes the level and distribution of health in a society, how law can be used as a tool um, for, um, for improving health, and how we can do a better job monitoring um, the spread of law across time and space uh, and, and create the necessary legal data for these evaluations. That's public health law to me, not just something lawyers do, but something that's actually sort of split between lawyers and non-lawyers, and which non-lawyers must own for this to work, um, which non-lawyers must accept as part of what they do. Uh, the most recent thing we've been working on to try and advance this idea and investigate it further is what we're calling the, the five essential public health law services. And this is, a, uh, this is an expansion, you might say, of, of a tool that's been very important in public health practice in America in the last 30 years, the 10 essential public health services, which were devised after a scathing Institute of Medicine report suggested that public health didn't know what it was doing, had no way of measuring whether it was doing whatever it was doing well, and really needed to get itself uh, in, in, in order. And so ultimately 10 essential services were identified, and that's been the basis for a lot of public health systems and services research. Well, we wanted to capture the same thing and, and achieve the same purpose. Um, so if you think about what you need to have in the supply chain, you might say, from initial problem solving when you face something like concussion to the point when you've identified a successful legal intervention or legal change and it's spread widely, um, this is meant to be it. Right? So initially when we are making policy, you need social and behavioral expertise. You know, when you're trying to define the problem, you need epidemiological expertise. You need legal expertise to try and figure out how law might um, be a source of intervention. Um, and that needs to be well, well networked together. You have to have lawyers and non-lawyers working together to develop policy. And typically, um, in our world, and I bet here too, most of the policy development comes from non-lawyers. Uh, now, eventually, you have a pretty good idea of how you might want to intervene. You are going to need uh, to invoke expertise in taking an idea and turning it into a viable legal framework and picking the right legal vehicle. Because it makes a big difference whether you're thinking of a statute on one end or an executive order or merely some kind of guideline. All these things, there are many mechanisms through which law can be, uh, which an idea can be put into law, and you need legal expertise for that. 
But then, of course, it has to get enacted. And that's a political process. It's a process of community engagement. It's a process of fighting industry or fighting people on ideological grounds. It requires lobbying. You have to have that, or the good idea isn't going to go anywhere. Right? Um, if something is enacted, it has to be enforced. And this is an area where I know in the US we've fallen drastically flat. Um, even to the extent that we get a good new idea in place, oftentimes enforcement is not considered or it's traded away um, in the political process. And so actually you have a nice law, but nothing you can do about it. We, had a, we, we spent years passing a stronger housing code in Philadelphia to deal with the problem of lead and other housing problems in, 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 in low-income rental housing. And it just didn't accommodate the fact that the city never collects fines. So that was sort of known, but didn't occur to anybody that passing a stronger law, but in a city that never collects fines, was probably not going to have a big effect. Um, and then finally, you have to have this policy surveillance and evaluation. Now, there's two points I want to make about this in closing. I mean, one is that you need all these things. If, you have, if, if, if a link is missing, that's probably going to be, represent a delay or a failure in the, in the ultimate scale-up process. Secondly, these things are obviously not all lawyer work, yet they're all related to law. They're all essential to, to having an effective legal solution. So you have to have lawyers and non-lawyers with a variety of kinds of expertise and experience working together, and they have to be robustly networked. This is really a picture of tobacco control. You know, in tobacco control, there was a pretty good network of all these different kinds of skills, and it's led to pretty rapid adoption, relatively speaking, of pretty successful legal interventions. Um, we just need to do that more often. It's how we get better health faster. It's not, you know, as I say, nothing new. It's just a little more strategic, a little more thought out, a little more conscious. So what is the prescription that I'm offering for better use of law and public health? We have to accept that we're a transdisciplinary field and that lawyers and non-lawyers are working together in legal interventions. Um, and think of this as a transdisciplinary enterprise. Uh, we then have to use the tools of public health evaluation and public health systems research, services research, to actually optimize how we do law, to make sure that we're actually using the best strategies, using the best tools, and that we have adequate networks in each of the areas in which we're working so that we can move as quickly as possible. Um, now, for lawyers, this, I think, means understanding law in more scientific terms as part of their basic training, and sometimes adopting scientific standards and practices in their legal work. For health professions, I think it means uh, understanding that law, accepting that law is a, another form of behavior, another set of institutions that can be studied just as others can be, um, and to adopt, you know, to be willing to uh, and recognize the importance of monitoring and particularly rapidly evaluating these legal treatments that we're putting out into the world um, with, with necessarily fairly little prior testing. Um, and what that leads to is a world in which um, we are provide, you know, we have better legal support for health agencies so that that, that legal expertise is there, um, where we're providing more TA, um, technical assistance um, with law, but also um, where we have got an ethic, a culture of evaluation uh, in law. You know, I've talked primarily about the U.S. I think it's, you know, the, when we think of this globally, um, it's, it's, it's even more important. Um, there's so much inattention to legal infrastructure at the global level and so much that could be done. Um, so I am happy to now spend some time taking questions and even more happy to deal with people you know, after the session. Um, you know, all our contact information is there. All our tools are available for people to use. And we provide assistance for people who want to use them. Um, and um, we're happy to help. Um, before we uh, throw it right up to questions, I'll invite uh, Jan to just uh, give a short response and then we'll have questions at the end. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks, Professor Jan, for the kind introduction. And to all of you, thank you so much for coming and spending your evening with us. Your presence here tonight, I think, is a huge credit to the pull power of Professor Burris, 
and also the level of local interest here in bridging the cultural divide, as Professor Barris put it, um, and disrupting the way that we currently do public health law. It's a real privilege to follow on from Scott, and tonight I'm going to have a go at responding um, to what was an intriguing presentation, I'm sure you'll agree. And in doing so, I'd like to add a local Australian flavour um, into the mix and reflect on a couple of the messages that were delivered tonight. As, as Professor Barris noted, that law is a powerful public health tool is, is quite well established and not an entirely controversial idea. Australia itself has a rich history of strong, effective and cost-effective public health law innovations and some of them were landmark policy designs that have even been uh, gone on to adopt, uh, been adopted by our global peers and plain packaging of tobacco is one such example. But more so for, for many of us, um, we can attribute these public health law innovations to our current quality of life and level of safety and health that we enjoy. Australia's gun laws, uh, which involve the smarter regulation of firearms, are a great example, and there are countless others. And some of them were mentioned tonight, um, and we mirror the US in that way. Um, mandatory seatbelt use, um, helmet uses on bikes, random breath testing, um, minimum ages of purchase for products known to be harmful or addictive. Uh, simple things, uh, food labelling, and we, we pay less for essential foods uh, which are free from the GST and therefore more accessible for everyone. But there is untapped potential, I think, in Australia. Um, really, we know these are missed opportunities because despite having a well-established universal health system and the 10th highest per capita income in the world, we have an epidemic of chronic disease. One in five Australians are affected by multiple chronic diseases, uh, and that's diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, poor mental health. And that level of burden has delivered a diminished quality of life for many Australians. And also significant costs to the individual, to families, and to the taxpayer. And worse, it's having a disproportionate impact on the most marginalised populations in Australia, um, such as our nation's First Peoples. At the national, state and territory, as well as the local government levels, I think we desperately need to take stock of and redesign the public policies that are failing our nation's health. And on that note, uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot to add to this, but um, I picked up on three core messages for moving this agenda forward in Australia. First is the need for innovative tools and methods, um, or rather the repurposing of existing tools to facilitate the measurement and evaluation of public health law expeditiously enough to, to actually play a real role in decision making. Second is the rigorous generation of, of evidence by experts across the board, as Professor Barris noted, by lawyers and non-lawyers alike. And the third is cultivating meaningful engagement with that evidence. As Professor Barris highlighted, the uses for both qualitative and quantitative tools to facilitate the study of public health law are vast, and the local uses are too. Um, there's numerous opportunity to investigate the strengths and weaknesses and the scope of deficits in public health law innovations and their performance over time. Uh, measuring public preferences for particular characteristics of controls. Uh, evaluating the cost effectiveness of different policy models. Identifying the key drivers of particular categories of decisions and to stimulate reform where necessary. And also to explore how health laws and, and non-health laws uh, interact and affect poor health and inequality. I think we've only really scratched the surface of these possibilities and early on in my PhD I, I came across the community of East Nowra in New South Wales and the local government in that community, Shoalhaven City Council, uh, on behalf of that population had rejected an application for what became a three million dollar 1500 square metre liquor outlet. A number of social services in the population, uh, local police together with 
uh, the community provided evidence that increasing the level of availability of cheap alcohol would not be conducive to the health of the population. Uh, they cited the current density of outlets uh, in the area. Uh, it was a socioeconomically disadvantaged area. Alcohol abuse was a significant problem. There were high rates of alcohol-related crime and domestic violence amongst the highest in the state. Um, a high incidence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Um, neglect and, and poor school attendance. Uh, these were just some of the social issues facing that population. And nonetheless, the, the court overturned the local government decision and the proposal went ahead. So we applied the, the tools of systematic inquiry to what we felt was an untapped area of health governance, the courts, and decisions that all too often go unnoticed. And consequently, we were actually able to investigate the drivers and the patterns and trends associated with such decision making across the country, but also over a five year period. And our findings amongst others uh, were that alcohol industry actors were successful over three quarters of the time in having local government decisions overturned. In our recent global review of alcohol controls um, that were designed or implemented by Indigenous communities, we found a widespread preference for legal responses to public health problems such as the harmful use of alcohol. Uh, and that included many in rural and remote Australia. And we found that most of these community-led controls were effective in addressing the often devastating effects of alcohol-related harms and uh, also effective in contributing to safer, healthier and more engaged communities. We were also, importantly, uh, able to identify the many unintended impacts associated with particular forms of legal controls. And in addition, we examined models that could facilitate more respectful and more productive relationships between governments and Indigenous peoples. Uh, and that was through a menu of regulatory measures that could or stood the potential, had the potential to reduce alcohol related harm and preventable deaths. Um, innovative tools have also been employed uh, by my colleagues um, at the George Institute and uh, the Prevention Centre. Um, Alexandra Jones, also at the George, uh, is investigating the extent to which partnerships with the food industry such as Australia's Voluntary uh, Healthy Food Partnership, achieve effective industry self-regulation and propose more responsive regulatory strategies where they fail. Uh, Professor Ivers and her injury team uh, recently examined in a paper, I think that was out a couple of days ago, um, examined driver licensing rates uh, and predictors of licensing in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And that study was able to highlight, firstly, the pervasive barriers to accessing the licensing system, and as well a strong association between driver licensing, education and employment. Um, Professor Burris's observations about the delay in applying scientific thinking to an area of governance that can have mammoth and often immediate effects for entire populations, I think is quite timely for Australia. Um, in, in our current context, I, I can think of a couple of major barriers to the generation of rigorous uh, public health law research. The first one isn't very sexy, um, but it is one that uh, Professor Barris mentioned earlier, and that is uh, funding for public health law research in, in prevention, especially. Um, speaking of the political, political economy of healthcare, the late Australian economist Gavin Mooney often made the point that debates about health all too often centre on health care, not the social determinants of health. And he said that ministries of health are ministries of health care. And what we often mean by health care is illness care. And we still see this dominate the public discourse and in how health is funded at both subnational and national levels. But where lifestyle factors are driving disease, in addition to illness care, we need significant investments in, uh, that are targeted at the broad areas that, uh, that affect our health, those social determinants, 
poverty, inequality, housing, transport and education, to name a few. But for that to happen, we've got to ensure that prevention work and public health law research is funded sufficiently. But what we've had recently are key institutions dismantled and uh, defunded, one being the Australian National Preventative Health Agency, and there are countless others, the National Indigenous Drug and Alcohol Committee, for one. The second barrier lies in training and education, I think. We need to ensure researchers with the relevant expertise are supported through education, training and opportunities to pursue public health law research. It's quite exciting to me, I think, that uh, some of the best universities in the US um, have begun to offer dual degrees in public health and the law. And I think interest is growing in Australia um, and credit is, is due to the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre and the George Institute, I think, for their their commitment to policy innovation and I'm certainly uh, very fortunate to be a beneficiary of their agile and forward-thinking approach. The third barrier is the apparent disconnectedness in, uh, of public health law and policy researchers and key decision makers in health and other sectors. Creating opportunities to bridge this gap is really the bread and butter of what the Prevention Centre does um, and, and I think a lot of that is helping to redefine our relationship with decision makers and the policy relevance of what we do. A major learning for me uh, has been the importance and the need for the co-production of evidence uh, in public health law research alongside policy makers so that we're asking the right questions and decision makers are receiving and employing the evidence that they need. I think there's, there's still a lot of opportunity to facilitate that, that kind of uh, co-produced public health law research, but nonetheless, the incentives for career researchers uh, and academics and for policy makers don't always align. The third theme that I, that I uh, uncovered during the, the talk earlier uh, is the meaningful engagement with evidence. Professor Barris framed it as a cultural issue, and I, I, I agree, I think it's just that. Decisions by policymakers, I don't think, need to be solely uh, informed by evidence um, and, and public health law research evidence, but at the very least, that evidence should be considered in a meaningful way. So that, where possible at least, decisions are informed by evidence that is current, uh, that is high quality, unbiased and generalisable, and that we're consistent, transparent and accountable in our approach. Um, this morning uh, at a prevention centre workshop, one such policy maker, or, or uh, one of the people we would call policy makers, uh, mentioned that such pejorative terms like bureaucrat and researcher and academic um, carry such strong reactions uh, in Australia and beyond and assumptions too, and I think there's probably something to be said about un unpacking those terms and, and moving forward, redefining them if necessary. And to conclude, I often think that to test, a good way to test for a worthy investment is to think about where we are and where we would be in its absence. And I think without rigorous public health law research, we continue to maintain that tunnel vision. We go without the chance to compare potentially more acceptable, more effective and cost-effective policy models to achieve worthy public health goals. I think we, we risk public confidence. Uh, ineffective gut-feeling lawmaking risks the public's faith in law as a potentially powerful public health tool. And that's in spite of our strong tradition of successful initiatives. Then there's the sheer expense of it all. There's, there's huge costs associated with mobilising communities about, around potential strategies uh, and uh, garnering political support, lawmaking as well. And then if the resulting strategies are ineffective, we're left with the costs of maintaining those ineffective strategies as well as the costs of the disease and injury that, that those strategies failed to prevent. Meanwhile, chronic, diseases, uh, chronic disease rates continue to rise um, associated with productivity losses uh, and increasing the costs of supporting our health system to treat preventable disease. 
And a final point that I'd like to make is that without rigorous public health law research, we risk compromising our international reputation as a human rights respecting nation by perpetuating ineffective and sometimes harmful approaches to disease and injury prevention, inequality and gaps in health outcomes for the most marginalised populations in Australia. So I'd like to think, really thank our speaker, Professor Burris, tonight uh, for delivering insights that really appear to be just as relevant to the Australian context uh, as they have been in the United States. Um, and I look forward to some lively discussion ahead. Thank you. I'll sit over here and... Thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to now so open it up to, to questions, um, including people who are tuned in on the, uh, the broadcast. Uh, does anybody have a question? We've got uh, a microphone going around the room. Thank you, Professor. Yep. Thank you, Professor Burrows, and thank you very much for your re rejoinder. Um, my question is around other law in other jurisdictions. Uh, I, I work and live in Victoria, and one of the biggest pieces of legislation that has huge public health impacts is our Planning and Environment Act, which at the moment doesn't have any objects that require health and social impact. Uh, to be conducted in a way that actually requires any development to prove that it will not be not only harmful but ideally health promoting. I just wonder, so much of the legislation that impacts on health happens outside of public health. Is there a way to connect up your really important work with the, the work that other uh, sectors might be doing that has public health impacts? I know it happens to some extent, but is there a way to um, influence the, the legislation, for example, in the urban planning sphere? I know you gave some examples of um, road design and so on and so forth, but at the moment, urban design is one of the really important, critical issues, um, certainly in my city. Thanks. Well, you know, I think that... Oh. Scott, could you speak into the microphone? Oh, I, I am oh, still on this one. Sorry. still live yeah, on that yeah, one. Yeah, so, um, you know, in fact... I appreciate the problem you're talking about, and, and it, but it sort of depends on the standpoint you're coming from. Uh, on the one hand, um, there are a lot of people who are doing research on areas of law and you know, environmental policy and so on. They don't think of themselves as doing health research. And you know, I'm, I'm not saying that we sort of have to make them say they're doing health research or we won't pay attention to them. On the contrary, I think you know, from, from our perspective in the world of health, we have to recognize that you know, in a world where we're thinking about social determinants, pretty much everything is a potential health factor. And we can't just say we're only, you know, if you call it a health law, I'll study it, but if you call it an environmental law or a planning law, I won't. So now in America, the hottest stuff we're funding research on in health is zoning law, um, minimum wage, um, paid leave, you know, all those areas, because, not because they changed, some sense, but because we realized, you know, we've actually got to take a broader view of what kind of social interventions or legal factors influence health, and we've got to take that seriously. Health impact assessment um, is something that, that has now, you know, been applied within the sort of health and all policies mantle that we should, you know, when we're, when we're doing a major transportation program or major housing program or an economic development program, you know, the thought is we should do a health impact assessment given that these, we, we presume that these things will have a health effect. So we've changed our you know, attitude, and I think that's really the, the answer from, from our program. Now, once you, we change our attitudes, we still have to convince people to do those assessments, and we still have to convince them to pay attention. And I'm not sure, from an empirical point of view, whether health impact assessment is an effective way, or health and all policies is an effective way of getting cooperation across silos in getting true attention to the potential health consequences of, of government policies. But it's certainly worth a try. It's a, it's a perfect example of the stuff I think we ought to be investigating pretty assiduously before we you know, bet everything on health impact assessment or health and all policies being the answer to our, our, our malplanning and, and poor governance problems. Jan, do you have any? Yeah, yeah no, I, I think that's um, a, a great response. 
if the the political appetite is there and uh, the appetite is there amongst decision makers, I think there's incredible potential to uh, to, to devise alternate um, models uh, other than social impact assessments uh, if, if, that's, um, if that's a viable route and, and that way we can uh, through con sort of continual eva evaluation and measurement see which models are most likely to work and, uh, and push the agenda forward that way without being so fixed on um, particular, particular models like the social impact. Thanks. Uh, I, I would like to follow up uh, with a question from uh, one of the um, participants on the broadcast. Um, uh, Sophia asks, <coughs> thank you for your address today and thank you, uh, the Australian Prevention Centre, for the opportunity to, to attend. Professor Burris, you spoke about people not liking the law and responding to it as being paternalistic. In Australia, we frequently hear calls in the media and social media about being a nanny state. I'm looking for some suggestions on how to respond to those who generally perceive law as paternalistic or controlling. What would be your response or arguments to someone like that, whose background you don't know? Well, over the years, we've, I think, seen a number of different kind of responses emerge to that claim. One is an empirical response. There's an interesting health affairs paper by Mello a um, year or two ago that was a survey of people's, essentially, expectations of government in relation to health. And in fact, there was a strong majority in favor of government action and accepting the idea that government should intervene across most of the areas that we're interested in. Um, you know, from my point of view, as somebody who tracks the law, I see an incredible appetite for public health law as measured by, I think, the best measure, how many of them are passed. Um, our state legislatures passed well over a thousand different public health laws in the last year, um, in the last two year legislative cycle. Um, and they passed them in blue states and red states, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. And uh, you, know, you saw the saturation of the concussion law how fast that went, and that's not an unusual situation. So if anything, there's a little too much enthusiasm for law, in my view, because if we do things so fast, we don't get a chance to test them um, before they, they, they spread to the whole country. Um, I think the third piece is more of a, of a kind of, you know, we can also have philosophical arguments. To me, one of the, the objections I've always had to the paternalism argument is that we live in democracies. If, if there's a parent, we're the parent. We elect the government officials who pass those laws. If we don't like those laws, we can vote against them next time. But that, that generally doesn't happen. And in fact, when you think sociologically of what happens to people who don't like the, the nanny state telling them to wear a seatbelt, is that six months down the road, they wouldn't think of driving without a seatbelt. If they don't like the nanny state telling them to put their child in a safety seat, a year later, they think it would be child abuse to have a child sitting in a car without a safety seat. Um, you know, it, it, it is an argument that I think is made largely for ideological reasons by those who have a, a reason to expect they will benefit by reduced regulation and reduced intervention. And we just have to call it that and point to the fact that in reality, people like the law, they want the law, and they, they realize pretty quickly that they benefit from the law. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Yes, um, thanks for your um, presentations on a really Im important issue. Um, my question sort of follows on from that uh, last question um, and it relates to wh what sort of role um, does uh, social norms play in the development and implementation of law and particularly the temporality of it. Um, because clearly there are some laws that have been introduced that have been extremely unpopular and don't have that uh, community understanding or support, you know, and seatbelt legislation, as you pointed out, was one of them. Um, and yet there are other laws that uh, have not been brought in that perhaps do have, um, you know, social su uh, support for it. So I'm wondering, you know, what sort of role um, does the social norms have and why is it that some laws can be brought in without uh, that level of social support um, or community support and other laws uh, falter and are rejected? Well, I'm trying to think of an example. You know, there's the, the big example in, our, in my experience in the U.S. of a law that failed to, to beat a prevailing norm and, and, and was essentially failed to, to spread was motorcycle helmet laws. Um, motorcycle helmet 
motorcycle riders really like this idea of being free and that, you know, the wind blowing through their hair, something I frankly don't understand at all, <laughs> but they really like that. And um, even, you know, unlike seatbelt laws or unlike child safety seat laws in terms of the traffic regulation or even drunk driving laws, once seatbelt, once helmets were required, there was massive disobedience and political mobilization. And people really fought it, and state capitals would be flooded with people on motorcycles protesting this, and a lot of states peeled back. And I mean, at some level, I think that's only to be expected. The law is not a magic tool for changing norms. You know, sometimes you have a good idea. It just takes a while for people to accept it. And they realize that the, the initial sense of inconvenience about using a new safety tool is overcome pretty quickly. It becomes a habit, and they don't mind. But sometimes... They just don't accept it, and they're entitled not to. It's not as if health is the highest goal of the society. You know, it's a good thing to improve health. If ultimately people don't buy that, that's what a democracy is. I just think that, you know, that's the real exception. It really rarely happens um, if a law is well conceived. I mean, we had another example, the portion cap. Uh, the, the city of New York tried to, to limit the size of a soda container. And, you know, arguably they, they blew it. People didn't want to be told how much soda they get out. Now, that's one story. The New York Health Department story is our polling showed a consistent reduction in soda consumption from the day we announced that rule. And it continued throughout all the fight and all the earned media that was raising people's consciousness of the, of the problems of eating soda, um, of drinking so much soda. So we think that was a successful intervention. It didn't actually lead to a law that went into force but it was using the law to get a message across. So, you know, it's a little complicated. Just keep trying. Um, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. Um, but by and large, the, the message again is people realize, when, when people learn that there are risks, if we have a good case for why something is dangerous, um, we have a good chance of convincing people to adopt a different behavior using the law. And ultimately, the, the, the legal norm becomes the social norm. Lawyers and non-lawyers involved in public health law research, we stand a much better chance at having the right kinds of conversations happening in the public discourse and it, it less controlled by uh, industry and, and political motivations. So I think uh, an increase in this, this sort of work will, will allow that to happen in Australia. And uh, I'd, be, I'd be interested to see, you know, with an injection of funding for this kind of work and, and the right expertise, whether we can, we can change the conversation when we do come across uh, windows for, for public health law innovations that can really uh, make a difference for, for our population's health. Um, Scott, I actually have a question um, as well. Uh, a lot of the research that you described in your program to me is um, about the prospective evaluation of a law once it's in place and following it up and monitoring and so forth. I wonder where you stand and what the state of play is on research that precedes the creation of law. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, about predictive modelling. Stuff that, I mean, in a way, once the law's in place, 90% uh, of the battle's been won, the, 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 the law's in place. It's, uh, uh, but where, how, how can we use and... and uh, in a sense, marshal the evidence that's needed to, to enact public health law in, in a way that's sort of pro-public health um, and, and what sort of methodologies you think are appropriate for that? Sort of well, that's it. It's both a methodological and a kind of practical political question. So let's take the methodological one first. I mean, the one thing we can't generally do is randomly assign people to be exposed to a law or not. Um, so, however, you know, there's a lot of work, the, the UK Prime Minister's Office uh, of Behavioral Intervention, and we have a similar one in our President's Office in the White House, have tried to use various tools, including predictive modeling and various kinds of experiments involving tests of the mechanism of the law, you know, tests of the effect of a, of a fine, that you can sort of do in a laboratory setting, so you can't actually roll out the whole law, but you can kind of test its active ingredient. And that stuff's pretty good. And especially if it's tied to a more strategic vision of, of where the, um, the behavioral and epidemiological evidence is taking us in terms of the etiology of, of, of threats to health and how intelligently we can start to graft onto those causal processes points of intervention in the law. 
you know, we can actually give vent lots of interesting legal possibilities, little legal treatments, and try and find ways to test them. The problem, the practical problem that arises is that it's hard to do this without a pretty close relationship with legislators, because legislators are driven by constituent telephone calls and by what's in the newspapers and what becomes perceived as a problem. And once something is perceived as a problem, but not before, they will act on that problem. Um, and they will act, if they'll act on the information they have available to them at, at that time, and they will act within a, a, a set of political calculations. So, you know, I showed the concussion story, and I think that's a good one because <clears throat> it was a problem about which there was growing evidence. Enough people accepted there was a problem. No good politician would have thought that there was any possibility of limiting, changing the rules of football in 2009. That just wasn't going to happen. An astute politician might have thought, though, that if we take this first step and we do this sort of secondary focus, you know, three or four years down the road, we, uh, by that intervention, we may have changed the political calculation. And there'd be more willingness in 2015, 2016 to see changes in football and other sports um, based on both growing evidence and changing political attitudes. You know, but once they start, you're on their schedule. You know, they're not going to wait for the research, nor in some sense should they wait for the research. I mean, we, you know, the, our job is to pay attention to that innovation and evaluate it as quickly as possible and give them feedback. And the interesting thing about evidence and policy is that if you look at a lot of, and I've looked at a bunch of areas, the sense, you know, early on you have politicians reacting as best they can to a problem that's defined as well as it can be. It's not a perfect solution. But over time, they actually pay attention to evidence. And if we start to see a better way, a better standard, a clearer rule in a, in a 10 to 15 year time span, you know, we see in the US the laws converging with the evidence. You know, we get a second chance or a third chance um, to amend the law. If you look at the, for example, child safety seat law, as the technical standards and evidence have changed, states have changed their laws 10, 15 times over 25 or 30 years. Um, so they are actually paying attention to evidence. It's just what doesn't happen is I do a study, it shows a problem, I have a legal idea, I give it to a, you know, I, or I have one state research, I give it to a, to a legislator and they say, okay, that's what we'll do. You know, I mean, it just doesn't work that way. It's a, it's a dialogue that unfolds over time. I've got one other question here from a um, person who's online. Um, I'm not sure actually if it's a question or a comment, so you might want to think a bit. Can public health be the first true multidisciplinary and non-siloed sector? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it can. <laughs> I'll take that as a question, actually. <laughs> um, any other um, questions? Sorry, could you speak into the microphone? Yeah. I question, I'm from a nutrition background. I was ask, going to ask about industry self-regulation. I can think of a number of examples with food um, where you've tried to, when in the health department, you've tried to get legislation through and, it, and it's, it's stopped with industry saying it will self-regulate um, and all of us kind of being disappointed. Are there examples of industry self-regulation that work and what underpins indus successful industry self-regulation? Well, you just mentioned you were studying that. Yeah, I, well actually uh, my colleague Alexandra Jones who's also a public health law lawyer at the George um, and I, also our colleagues at the University of um, Sydney Law School uh, are looking into food policy and there's a food law conference uh, coming up um, very shortly and I think a lot of the work that they have done have raised serious questions about the effectiveness of these voluntary mechanisms. Um, it certainly points to either us needing um, to, to sort of uh, restructure the mechanism so that, that accountability is a, um, a little bit more likely in these cases where there aren't any sort of serious consequences for, for not complying um, and not moving forward the, the, the health agenda, particularly for, for children. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm yet to sort of see a voluntary um, mechanism that is really effective in, in holding industries to account. Um, and it's, it's difficult with, I think, with the food industry, which is very different from the tobacco industry. We need food. Um, and so it's, there, there's a lot of work to do, I think, in, in making sure 
that uh, uh, we have the information that we need when we're, we're trying to make healthy choices um, and that uh, things like added sugar are, um, are, are evident in the, the products that we pick up. Um, and there's also a, a personal responsibility factor in, in um, uh, people sort of seeking out the, the right uh, healthy choices, I think, because industries respond to, to our buying habits. Okay, look, I think we're uh, sort of uh, at the closing time, so um, Fred will have to uh, finish now. But um, can you all join me in thanking Scott and Jan for fantastic <laughs> Thank you.